Hey, it's the Chief. I'm live with Bonding with Board Games and RPGs. We're going to talk about both some board game stuff today and a bunch of RPGs that I went kind of hog wild on uh, and ordered. So we're going to wait for some more folks to come in here a little bit. We'll talk about my part one and part two interview with uh, Wolfgang Klein, who's uh, making the uh, tactical World War II game Assault. Red Horizon 41 with some other expansions planned out. If you saw the thumbnail before you came in, uh, the thumbnail is one of the screenshots uh, from our interview. I think that was part two because of a glitch that I'll talk about where um, he's got plans. And that was a Western Front Sicily um, plan there. And then he's talking about Rangers and 82nd Airborne and fortifications and he's already got an expansion uh with artillery and air power so the stuka um uh, very cool and uh, the system uh as he was showing it is clearly um designed uh to have other all these other expansions added on he's a one man i shouldn't say one man show he's working full-time somewhere else a lot of friends are helping him and he's working on it um continually i liked uh his analogy i'm sure it sounds even cooler in german but was that he's always throwing the stone further ahead and other people kind of keep him on track for do this do this do this and he's chucking that stone uh, toward the horizon, which is cool. Um, so we'll also talk about uh, the battle coin or the challenge coin, uh, which I ended up even ordering. So uh, in the midst of the RPG session with um, Evil Twilight 2000, you had Pacheco, for those that haven't been following that. Um, I had no idea this character was going to come along, and he had some military background. He had a challenge coin in his pocket. I'll get to some of the commenters coming out. I'll share a screen that shows us a little better. And I just um, was thinking, well, what would he do with these orphans that he's kind of been uncling or fathering? Fathering? That sounds, no wonder I call it uncling. uncling. Fathering sounds sexual. <laughs> he's uncling them. He's training them. Um, and in the midst of the game, I thought, you know what he would do here? He would share this coin with Casimir, the oldest orphan brother. And uh, I didn't even know a coin existed. Uh, I'd randomly made up this character. Um, uh, I'd rolled and so he was former SWAT and uh, New Hampshire came up as, as where he was from. And it turns out there's a no, New Hampshire-like tactical team or SWAT team and uh, I'm assuming this is real, and it's their challenge coin. Let's look at a couple comments here, and you may hear the grandkids in the background because I can hear them. So we'll see. They're going to be leaving soon uh, to go get some haircuts. But what do we have? We have ah, Karyasis is in. Uh, been a while. Uh, you trying to do a Ben Davidson mustache? You know, Rolly Fingers. Rolly Fingers is what's going on, and uh, so far. My work hasn't told me to shave it, so we'll see. I do like how I kind of get this like uh, Three Musketeers thing going on here, but I would need to shave the sides. But they're all getting so white, who can who can see it? Zhao, I'm sure I'm still pronouncing your name wrong. Hello, sir. Hello. So I'll let a few more folks wander on in, and we'll circle back, and I'll show some of the – I've got a bunch of role-playing games I'm playing here. Ether Fields, for those that know what that is, um, Awaken Realms Games puts out these amazing board game, card game slash things that are just unbelievably grand. It's a company out of Poland. And uh, I, I tend to get sucked in. I back them on Kickstarter. They had Tainted Grail. I backed that. Uh, the USS um, uh, Vanguard will be coming out soon. But I backed Etherfields or Etherfields, which is a dreamscape card thing. It's so massive. I don't know if I'll ever play it or I'll dream of playing it in retirement. May I live that long? And um, <laughs> that's also what I'm propping this 
my computer up on. I'm very unhappy with this dedicated webcam from Logitech that I ordered. It seems I get washed out. Um, it feels like it doesn't have the 1080p, which it's supposed to have. I can't get it to white balance right. And I noticed when I was having the glitches with Wolfgang and I was working for my computer and the camera and having to reconfigure, I'm like, this camera looks better. Um, it's tighter, um, but I like it better than the visual stuff I'm getting on my normal. So if anybody, you guys that have watched the show frequently, if if you don't mind this, I've actually got it propped up on the Etherfields box, which is huge. So, uh, so I could get the right angle instead of it pitching, pitching up my nostrils. So, um, didn't think I'd be saying nostrils, pitching up my nostrils. Um, let's see, let's talk about Wolfgang Klein. He is the designer of Assault Games and their Red Horizons 41 is the first game out. So it's tactical game. Um, it's got this cool dice rolling mechanism with these beautifully engraved dice, uh, multiple colors, and uh, based on the unit you're attacking, they'll have a card, and that card will tell you, you know, oh, the uh, the T34. You're attacking the front of the T34, which you know by the angle of the hexes that you're in or they're in, and then it'll say, okay, on the card, I'm attacking from this range, whatever that range is. Um, and I'm attacking the front, and this is how many dice that the defender will roll, and this is how many dice the attacker will roll. And then the dice are very high quality. They're like Fantasy Flight. Um, oh, shoot, now I'm blanking on uh, Descent. They remind me of those dice, nice chunky dice, uh, high quality. And so all of this configuration of slope and thickness of armor is all taken care of by, oh, I get to roll a red dice. That's, um, you know, way better defensive. Or if I'm attacking with an 88, um, a red die, a much better chance of penetrating. And then you have critical hits, hits, suppression, misses. I think that's it. I might be missing something. Uh, we've got a welcome here. Hello. Hello. Back at you. Is it Never fear 1911. Ooh, good old 45. Hard to break down. I've got one of those and I can never remember how to break it down and get her back together. My Glock just comes apart nicely. I'm a sergeant in the police department. So yes. And I've been a medic in the army. So I've been around weapons. Let's see. What do we got here? Uh, not caught up on the latest episode of Krieg's story yet. Um, it's a good one. I will give you one little tip spoiler. He suddenly can hit. He starts act actually hitting stuff, which is amazing how it works out. I was surprised. Um, we'll come back to Wolfgang. Hey, speaking of that, maybe we won't. We'll stay right on Wolfgang. Here he just came in. Um, nice to hear you again. Unfortunately, no time today, but we'll repeat the funny live blog. It wasn't funny to me. Oh my God. Oh, by the way, I want to apologize. I'm going back re-watching and then tagging everything so that people can find it. It's because there's the breaks and back and forth. And I realize when we're in part two, what you're telling me is you're you've already told your family, your spouse that you're you're gonna be doing this. So if we've got to do a part three, we'll do a part three, whatever we gotta do. Um, and um, your beautiful saying in uh the German military was something like um, staying within or fighting the problem or working with the problem. And I kind of bailed on it after I, I kept dropping and picking up. I thought I've got to end the second stream, uh, even though we kind of picked up and tried a third time. And I realized Wolfgang, I think what you were saying was, Hey, let's stay. Let me get the rest of these slides out. Now that the grandkids have left, you can hear my dog barking in the kennel. Um, and I think you wanted to stay right then. So I apologize if I cut you off early. I misunderstood. And I was a little nonplussed. I was like, my goodness. Uh, what do we got coming in here? Uh, Laugh Aloud Creek finally landing shots near the end of the series. How did this guy become a leader? Laugh Out Loud. Um, hold on. My wife, I think, kindled the dog. And that's going to kill me. Um, let me see. Maybe not. Hold on.
Okay, we've got to just ignore that. And you're probably going to hear the dog now. <laughs> so, uh, Krieg, finally landing shots near the end of the series. How did this guy become a leader? His leadership's great. His marks and marksmanship sucks. Let's be honest. I've been around some leaders that can't shoot on the police department, some of which have been good leaders, some of which have not been good leaders. But I'll give them this. I was around one very good leader who was a mediocre shooter and knew he should be out at the range more. But he still shot with everybody on the rank and file. You had some of the leaders, some of our command staff, they would design a special command staff range time so that they only shot with themselves and weren't embarrassed about how poor their shooting skills were with the rank and file. But of course, that information gets out anyway, and they would have been much better maybe practicing some more or just owning that they're not great in all things. But go figure, that is how the world works. Um, let's see. So with Wolfgang here, maybe he's left already. Um, so my apologies to Wolfgang for that. Maybe I should have held on and got those last couple slides that you wanted to show up. I will have you on again. Love having you as a guest. Um, uh, going back and rewatching it so I could do the, uh, the little um, uh, intros and slides um, really helped me watch it again as a viewer as well. Man, that dog is going to kill me. Is the dog kenneled? Sorry. No, please. All right. Maybe that'll take care of itself. Um, but I did go back and tag all the little time elements in the Wolfgang Klein Assault Red Horizon 41 interviews so that they're a little easier to pop around with the breaks. Wolfgang get, did a great job hanging on for a while. Here's the weird thing. Um, uh, I didn't even know we had dropped for a while because Wolfgang was talking and my screen didn't drop out and I was still hearing him. It was bizarre. And then I had to wait for a full restart from um, my provider. And I actually thought I was probably going to be down, you know, for an hour or so. Then it popped up and then it went down again. So, um, yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, we'll see if we glitch on this one. It's been like six, seven years, multiple shows, multiple lives, and I've never had a drop like that. So I don't know, Wolfgang, sorry. Um, let's see. Let's talk about the role-playing game I'm in. So I've got, uh, let's see. Let me, let me answer the question here. Have you thought of playing other RPGs on the channel other than Twilight 2000? Yes. Matter of fact, I'll talk later, but I played this already. I did a little one-off into the odd. It's an old school renaissance. OSR is what they call it. I didn't know really what that was until Chris McDowell. I was listening to his uh, blog, which is Bastion Land, I think. He's got a, a little blog you can read, and then he's got a podcast you can listen to. If you go to Bastion Land, you'll find it. Um, and I played this, and it's the, the whole element. It used to be a little zine, which I'll talk about, a little magazine, a little thing, which I'll get into those in a second. This is a remastered version. Um, and kind of the whole premise is that character development's fast. Um, your equipment's just kitted out, and that kit kind of sends you down the line of who or what or whatever your character may or may not be. And then you just move forward with very three things, uh, strength, dexterity, and what, wisdom, I think. It's been a while since I've gone back and played it. And things resolve quickly with a 20-sided die. And it played really well. You can go, it was a one-hour, one-off kind of thing. Once I'm done with uh, Twilight 2000 Season 1, which seems to be getting near the end, I bet you I got two or three episodes left, I will go back and do some more Viking and the Twins, um, which were very interesting characters uh, that just created themselves as we went. So that was fun. And it's weird. Not only is Into the Odd was supposed to be original D&D, &D, uh, but it's got this horror haunted kind of feeling to this city of Bastion Land. And then there's the 
uh, stuff that's out in the country and uh, it's just wide open and odd. And, uh, and I loved how it played. Um, have you thought, oh, sorry, same question. Um, oh, very much like Maze Rats. Yeah, Maze Rats was actually the genesis of, or came out of this build. Matter of fact, let's talk about it. So first of all, my record keeping skills, I, I was getting behind. And I thought, man, you know what I need? When I was in middle school, way back in 1982, baby, I had a trapper keeper. <laughs> and I thought, too bad they don't make trapper keepers anymore. And then I got on the web. They make trapper keepers, baby, in this 80s style. Look at this, trapper keeper. So I went and got a trapper keeper. Now, it feels a little flimsy. I'm sure it was this flimsy. I just blew my white balance, by the way. Let me see if I can get that back in. Yes. All right. So Trapper Keeper will blow your balance. But look at this. All right. A little Velcro. I'm going to show you what's in here because I've got Maze Rats right here that I printed off drive through, And I got Black Hack, which is this other game over here. And a lot of them give credit to what Chris McDowell did with his original zine Into the Odd. And the idea that it's just short, quick, fast, your characters may or may not die. You know, you may have a lot invested into them, but they can just go. And then you come up with new ones. Well, that led me down the road of Ben Milton's Knave, um, which, again, I haven't played this yet. I picked it up, thumbed through it, because what I plan to do is just jump in and out of several of these RPGs. I was using Maze Rats for some of my NPC on the fly character development. There's so many charts in there that, uh, that it was just great for using that with Twilight 2000. Much like I'm using the Mythic Emulator, um, and this is their magazine where they sell. I'm so in deep, I'm buying these books after uh, um, uh, Tanya Pigeon goes and puts them in bound form. And this is ways you can expand that mythic simulator where you're, it's like an Oracle where I can ask questions and random events can happen. But I picked up Nave. I saw a question. Let's see. Uh, you have black hack as well. Awesome. Um, have to give that a shot. I also picked up Karen and another little tiny zine, which again, I've read through, but I haven't played yet. And then with my grandkids, um, which are, were just over. Um, I knew this would work for him. And Isaac Williams did Mouse Ritter and he had a boxed version. And I went in and bought this boxed version of Mouse Ritter. And it's got this cool, very approachable thing for the kids. And it's a little more tactile with your gear and stuff being slotted right onto your player board. And, you know, you're a mouse, so you have to run away. You can't just fight everything. A cat is the equivalent of like a massive dragon or something. So you've got to think your way out of it. And my son, who actually kind of reinvigorated me in RPGs, he likes RPGs. He's 15 more than board games. And uh, so I started doing some uh, fate stuff with him. Um, and he saw this and wanted to play this as well. So this is what we're going to play next as a family. And I've got a six-year-old grandson and, and just turned four-year-old granddaughter who always likes to join in. And I was teaching her how to count pips on a die. And uh, it was funny. She's big for age and I had numbered dice. So I thought that would be easy. She didn't know the numbers and she was just guessing. And I thought, oh, I pulled out some pips and we started working on just dice roll-offs. Um, you have that too. Excellent. And I had to get blades in the dark. Now that's a little bit thicker tome there. Um, but uh, the idea that you're all just, you know, like, I think thieves, I thumbed through this and um, I should have, I was kind of aware of this from um, fate, um, the, uh, the fate rules I purchased from uh, the same company, which is Evil Hat Productions, but uh, I wasn't doing any OSR stuff. And, but when I heard an interview on Chris McDowell's podcast with the designer of this, I immediately went and purchased it. Now, one last thing. I've got a cop buddy who just recently retired who's role-played. While I was board gaming and war gaming, he was role-playing. 
And he was like, man, I've been learning the cipher system from Monty Cook. And so I want to learn yet another system. This one's interesting. Not that you got to know all that, but this allows you to kind of like fate, grab anything and just play it. And what I've been wanting to do is anybody out there, if, if you were reading like pulp novels, fiction, apocalyptic novels in the 80s like I was, anything Survivor-like, uh, Red Dawn-ish, I was all over. And I was a fanatical reader. I had a great sixth grade teacher, got me hooked on reading. And, uh, and I was reading all of this stuff. And there was a game, or a book, a game, a book called End World. The covers are beautiful. I still have mine. They're all very 1980s, think, um, Schwarzenegger commando kind of looks to them, but it's got this cool setting and I want to grab the setting and I want to use either fate or maybe even the twilight 2000 rule set, or maybe cipher. I've got to figure it out. And I want to go in and do my own solo playthrough of this post-apocalyptic world where literally everything's kind of gotten a little crazy. Um, uh, any GURPS, you know, I was looking at GURPS and I talked to my buddy and if you haven't seen, um, oh boy, now I'm blanking on his name, Trevor, um, me, myself and die. If you want to see a great high production solo RPG game, Trevor, I'm forgetting Trevor's last name. He's a voice actor. Um, he does a show, me, myself and die. He's on three episodes and he does these mages library where he pulls these RPGs off his shelf and talks about them. And uh, I don't know if GURPS is my style. Probably maybe what the Apocalypse, it's got a catchy name, Apocalypse Now? No, that's a movie. <laughs> There's this Apocalypse system that I could see using, and I may get that at some time. I also, from, oh, I'm forgetting the old fantasy war game well, war game, role-playing game from the same guys that did GURPS, GURPS, GURPS. Oh, Duvall, Trevor Duvall. Yes, Trevor is unbelievable. He's awesome. Uh, his voices, the characters, but really the way he just lets the story evolve. He's the one watching his show that got me interested in the mythic system, the mythic um, emulator. And I thought, oh, that's genius. That's what I need. That is exactly what I need. And so um, thanks to Trevor, Tanya Pigeon and Tanya Pigeon's work with all her mythic stuff. Oh my gosh, Tanya is awesome. And uh, I was literally uh, just emailing her as a fan saying, hey, when are you going to put the uh, little zines into a printed format? Because I want to buy them. I had purchased one of them. They've got this beautiful way you can explore a city. And with Twilight 2000 putting their uh, city expansion kind of on hold, my understanding is it may come out soon, but that uh, with everything going on in the Ukraine, they were kind of parking it a little bit. They wanted to stay fantasy and not so gritty post-apocalyptic Poland. But um, powered by the apocalypse, yes, that is it. That is it, never fear. You, sir, are a great RPG gamer. My buddy uh, Story, his name is literally Story, Sergeant Story. It was a great, great name. Um, he has come over to the house and run a few sessions. He actually, uh, Forbidden Lands, he's the one that introduces me to Free League for the first time. And my son, he runs it. Uh, he GMs it. And my son had this, I think my son was only 13 at the time, and he created this crazy character that, I mean, he's gaming with my buddies and they were all like, your kid is awesome. <laughs> and he loved it. Check Iron Sworn out. Yeah. I actually pre-ordered the, the sci-fi version, which I'm blanking on that. Uh, I, I saw his second season of Iron Sworn. I'm not as much into fantasy. I like sci-fi post-apocalyptic, even Western. Um, I'm running a homemade uh, setting I did. Uh, with time travel, which is freaky, and any kind of history piece. And I've got a group that comes over and plays using fate, fate core system. Uh, but uh, we are the TTP. Uh, my son named that the time, I can't remember. 
We're some kind of we're maintaining a timeline because it's being altered. Starforged, yes, sir. That is it. That's supposed to be popping here in November, I think. Um, uh, because I've got a fate system that deals with um scum and villainy or something that deals with that as well. But I love space. Oh, and uh thanks to Free League, I've got uh de death in space which I, I have a whole idea for that. So way too many ideas, not enough time. That's, that's my life right there. Mm. But I'm working hard my last five years, not 10, five years, maybe six. Then I'll be retired from law enforcement uh, as long as I don't get uh, shot up here before that. We got crazy the last few years. Um, I'll be retired and then I will do this full time. Full, full time. Now, speaking of that, let me share the screen. And this is the coin that is pictured as the thumbnail. And when I was filming the episode with Pacheco and the orphans up on the roof, I won't spoil it if nobody's seen it, but he basically has this like touching moment. Uh, so I'll explain just this part. It's not ruining anything this touching moment with the oldest orphan. And uh, he ends up giving him a challenge coin, this coin that you see. Now, I didn't even know this coin existed. This is the beauty of role-playing. Um, I just knew in the police department, you'll you'll have challenge coins in your pocket. It's an army thing as well, or military thing. And I had him just giving over, I, I named it like some kind of SWAT coin. No idea what it is. Casimir took it and uh, and put it in his pocket. And then the scene, it becomes much more of a tangible object as the scene plays out. Go watch that episode. I want to say it's like episode 32 to see what I'm talking about. But when I was done, I was like, man, I wonder if there's a coin from a New Hampshire SWAT team or something. And I found this. This says that's the one side. The flip side, I don't have a picture of. I'll show you. It's the central, yeah, central New Hampshire Special Operations Unit um uh forever ready but this coin was so cool and then i was able to go out and purchase it myself um not that anybody needs to do that it was 25 bucks some people had it for like 50 i was like what are you doing that's could probably cost 10 to 15 dollars if you buy it from a coin dealer or the people that make them but this coin is now at, at my house and it it has kind of become tangible for me because I think Casimir, the lead orphan, is going to use these sayings. I could see doing a season two of Twilight 2000 if the orphans make it. There's no guarantee that they'll make it. But I could see them using the rules of this coin to guide their actions within game. There's the flip side. Let me get the white balance back. No, it came back. And that... That whole thing, this is where role playing is amazing and, and solo role playing has been just as amazing because I have no idea, you know, where these episodes are going to go or how things are going to work out. I try to keep things randomized enough that I'm surprised. Now I can still decide, oh, you know, part of the mythic system is what's the likelihood of this? Is this uh, impossible? Is this just 50, 50? Who knows? Um, and uh, so I still get to kind of set that, but then it's a die roll and the dice will tell you what's going on. So uh, struggle of the RPG games. Yes, it's a beautiful struggle though. Beautiful struggle. Um, like I said, this, it's actually got a pretty interesting magic system in it. And I've never dealt with, uh, um, even as a kid, I played Twilight 2000, a little bit of Dungeons and Dragons, but I was always like a knight or something. And uh, this has this these little pieces of, of obsidian glass that have like a ancient script or something on them. And they have one, two or three uses. And in order to recharge up that little obsidian glass, you have to do something. So like in this one, I made my character um, a healer and or the dice kind of made him a healer. And he has a, a special little object that in order to recharge it after he's done some health saves for people, 
Um, I have to put a drop of my blood on it. I got to keep it in the dark for two days or something. So there's these little things with the rules that can almost be side quests in and of themselves, which is so interesting. Now, again, I don't, with the grandkids of six and four, I don't know how gritty we're going to get. I may just say you can heal people and then it takes three days before you can again. I don't know if I'll be telling about drops of blood and stuff. But my son, who's 15, was like, this looks awesome. So um, very cool, very cool in that system. So that's what I wanted to talk about was um, if you've ever tried solo gaming, war gaming or whatnot, B-17, Ambush, a lot of these other, you know, Omaha Beach, um, solo RPGing is very, very doable with the Mythic system. Uh, I mean, go to drive through. Uh, um, is a drive through review. I always just click it and go to it. Uh, the RPG place, and you can just buy the like PDF for three bucks, five bucks, print it off yourself, and uh, and you've you've got a system that you can use to just role play on your own. A couple dice in your pocket, you could be on the train, on a plane, anywhere, any anywhere. So let's see. Um, let's circle back a little bit. Wolfgang's gone. But, oh my gosh, if anybody watches those lives, I've never had drops. And it was, thank you to the fans, Trevor. And, and uh, who's the other person in there? Oh, I'm blanking. Um, the questions asked to Wolfgang were great. And it really kept the feed alive until I finally got the system back up, was able to text him or email him and say, hey, let's try a brand new feed. And then sure enough, we dropped shortly thereafter again. But uh, uh, the fans that came in and asked the questions were just awesome and kept things going. And he has agreed to come back on. And uh, uh, I don't know what happened. Like I said, it could have just been a bad day for my tech provider, my internet provider. Mythic Variations is good as well. Yeah, I went and bought everything. I thought, man, I don't know if I'm going to like this at all. I see what Trevor uh, Duvall is doing. I got the blue Mythic emulator, printed it. I thought, you know what? Five bucks, that's a burger and some fries. No big deal. And then immediately loved it. Loved it because I was, there is in Twilight 2000, I'm going to do a review of Twilight 2000. I've done an unboxing, but now I've got, I'll, I'll end up with 36 solo games. And then I've played online with Dan and Ron uh, what do we get to 11 or 12 games that may come back if our schedules can ever line up. But for the solo, there was a little bit of an Oracle, not a little bit. They have an Oracle on the back, but it wasn't enough. I could tell I couldn't quite get things to do. And, uh, and then this came along. My buddy, actually Sergeant Story told me, Hey, go, go watch Trevor, see how he does it. And as soon as he started using that emulator, whoo, I got it and I was off and running, having a ball, having a ball there. Didn't even know solo role playing existed until I read it in the back of Twilight 2000, fourth edition, and then saw Trevor's show. And uh, so that has been, uh, if anything, I've got to be careful because um, role playing has, uh, it was, I, I hadn't played role playing games. Well, okay, so I hadn't played Twilight 2000 since I was like 13, the very first edition. Stepped away from role-playing and was doing all board gaming. Ambush, uh, B-17, Queen of the Skies as a kid, um, and stayed in that realm. And, um, and then was doing some online gaming, Day Defeat, Conflict, uh, 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 Counter Counter-Strike. And then when my son was like, you know, I kind of like role-playing more, that's when fate happened and we started doing a little bit more role-playing. And now I'm deep, deep into the role-play. <laughs> I know Monty Cook. Well, I don't know about his book. I know he lives in Kansas City. I don't know the man. But, oh, my, awesome. So, yeah, it's it's a great time to be a gamer. Great time to be a gamer. So let's see. Um... Any other questions? So never fear. Variations too. Yep. Simplify stuff without having to use the table. Yeah. Uh, I think I picked up both of those. And then 
these little articles expand more because that was part of the reason I got uh, the uh, the magazine. The number sixteen deals with how to randomly create a city, and you can go a little village, you can do a town, you can do a city, you can do like a, a metropolitan New York type city. And they're all just done in a little thing, but then, oh, you're in a brand new area and it's a whole different feel. And, and this exploration is there, which is what is so fun as a solo role player. I've even stepped in with my son when I was working on our own little system we had. And I said, well, I'll play a character, but we're going to let the emulator answer some questions and we can kind of figure out what would make logical sense together. And he was like, I don't think that's going to work. I usually kind of GM'd for him or his buddies. And I said, I don't know, let's try it. You know, and then boy, it worked great. And he was a slow convert, but he was a convert. And uh, you know what? It works best is when he gets in trouble and loses his digitals. <laughs> and by digitals, I just mean his phone, his iPad, and his Game Boy or whatever the heck that's called. And then all of a sudden he's like, dad, can we role play some more? <laughs> and I'm like, son, I need to just take your stuff away from you all the time. So, all right, we are getting into 36 minutes. I will run to 45. If anybody has any questions on anything, it could be police related, have nothing to do with this. And I'll answer those as long as it's something I can answer. Um, RPG related, war game related, or... Um, Kansas related. I'm sure somebody wants some Kansas info. <laughs> whiskey related. I've got a whiskey channel called Scotch Test Dummies. That's what you see on these. We've done these live shows before. Been to, been to Ireland. Waterford flew us out. That was fun. Whiskey companies have a little more money, I think, than board game companies. Not all, though. Not all. So, but that was fun. We got the Royal treatment, got flown out to Ireland and did some great things. Great things. My co-host does not really play many games. He plays, uh, Simon puts out the zombie game. And when he got a chance to play that, he was kind of mocking it. And then it worked really well. And he started playing it with his boys who were in high school. Um, I want to see how Krieg's story ends. Me too. Me too. Dark character. I've had a few comments where people are like, man, next season, don't play evil. Um, I won't. Uh, so um, when I get back to Twilight 2000, because I am going to do some different things, I will, I've already decided if the orphans survive, if the orphans survive. So there's no guarantees. I don't know if they'll make it. I would imagine at least one of them will make it. There's three. If they make it, I'm going to focus on them for season two. Now, it doesn't mean I might not go back to Krieg on another season or something uh, because there's still unfinished business with Krieg. But season one will end once this uh, siege is over of the base. And uh, I can we're nearing that. Um, and it's kind of been, I, I actually, at one point in my head, I thought they're going to, this, this base is going to fold. I thought, they wouldn't. And then I thought, well, well, now maybe they won't because of the last episode. I thought that was crazy. I didn't think that would happen. And me not knowing what's going to happen next, when I sit down to play, I'm like, let's see. And it's like, I get to be the first viewer because <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. I kind of know what the characters might do. And I try to stay true to what they would do, but then I can always go to the Oracle or the uh, fate system uh, with the emulator mythic and just ask and uh, the dice will tell me. So yeah, I can't wait either. So um, let's see, maybe he dies uh, or he becomes a villain in the next season. That could be true as well. Uh, he's kind of a villain now. I couldn't believe when uh, the farm wife's husband was the lone survivor and was captured by Bartex group, but she was captured by Krieg's people, which if anybody wants to know what that means, you can go look. Krieg took a liking to her and uh, how that all worked and the fact that he survived. 
Uh, though what is Krieg even going uh, even going to that is heroic. Maybe he isn't a hero, but people simply view him as such. Right. Yeah, I mean, that was some of the idea was that, um, I mean, in 27 years of law enforcement, uh, I will, I'll just tell you, I was actually on a very minor role, minor, minor, minor. I was on the BTK task force. Um, in the, the most minor role you could imagine, I was on that task force and he is, well, he's still alive. He's in prison. He's a serial killer. And he operated when I was four and living in Wichita before we'd moved out and, uh, get on the department. I happen to be in an undercover unit. They needed undercovers to do very menial tasks, <clears throat> usually picking up discarded cigarettes and such <laughs> to test for DNA. Uh, because we had like a thousand BTK suspects. So, um, in the course of my duties, I've run across evil before, not often, but often enough. Um, so I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to play somebody who looks one way kind of to everybody, although the leakage is there, but he's a sadist and, uh, and a serial killer and evil and will do the bad thing if he can get away with it. And when better for a evil serial killing sadist to get away with it than to be in a situation of, uh, Armageddon or post apocalypse. Um, what is Krieg even going to do? Oh yeah. As hero, what's he going to do? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so, I mean, with his resources and such, and if you're in a situation of privation, I mean, look what he did. He ended up saving the orphans. Now I'm using a book, 48 Laws of Power, because I thought, how am I going to run a serial killer? I don't know. I mean, I got some general, you know, I've ran into one, but a real one, but otherwise it's all media stuff. And I thought this book, this book here could be the guide. It's a very Machiavellian 48 laws of power book and put in the hands of a sadist, they would follow it. And I thought that'll be my guide. And that will run three episodes. Now, as I got into some time compression where we were popping away from Krieg, I would keep uh, a law is what those 48 laws of power are. And I would keep that. And that worked really, really well. And if I ever have to play Krieg, I will use that book again. Um, because sometimes it was be generous, which is what happened when he runs into the orphans. And he tells them, go to the base, tell them Krieg sent you. And it was weird because I didn't know that was going to happen. And all of a sudden I started getting comments. Hey, I want uh, what's going on with the orphans? More stuff with the orphans. I thought, you bet. I don't know what's going on with the orphans. And then this branching story with Pacheco kind of adopting them as an uncle figure, a rough uncle, and them learning how to fight OJT on the job and how, I mean, it was just really intriguing. And um, I knew this already of me, which is good for role-playing is when I read a book, an author can really capture my attention and I will get lost in a book. Um, the really good books, I, I will begin to feel like the character in the book and these things are happening to me. That's what hooked me in sixth grade was a book called My Brother Sam is Dead by the Collier Brothers. And I got sucked in and I was in that narrative in a way that a movie almost never can get you there. The Matrix is where I like movies or even what Star Wars did for the first time because they took me in places I didn't even imagine. But a book, when they get into my imagination, is when they're, when they're nice. For me, a movie, when they take me to places I've never imagined, is what a movie does for me. But uh, and that's where role-playing has been so, so fun, is that uh, my, my imagination just rolls and goes with it. Uh, I actually get attached. I was very surprised. I was attached to Pacheco, a completely fake character. <laughs> I don't even know anyone named Pacheco. Um, but uh, I felt like I knew that person. 
And he was like, no one I knew, which is weird. Uh, we could uh, interpret his generosity as him being selfish, just gathering more forces. Sure. And uh, part of the 48 law of power, whatever that was, was display generosity, make sure other people see it because they'll perceive you in a, in a nice way. So it was very self-serving. Uh, couldn't generosity always be that way? I think it could be. Um, we have someone in Wichita around Christmas. Um, they, they're, they're fairly wealthy and what they will do. And, uh, first started like 16 years ago, a man, all we know is it's a white man and he had a young son. That son of course has aged over the years, but around Christmas, they will go up to folks for whatever reason and, and give them, they'll say Merry Christmas and give them like a little box in the box is a one ounce gold coin, which depending on where gold that could be worth $2,000 and they'll hand some of these out. But it's just like once or twice and it's always off guard and they walk away anonymous. No one knows who they are. They know they're always well-dressed. Well, that is obviously a what appears to be, I guess we don't know, a wealthy man teaching his son how to give. That I think is pure like giving there. Yeah, obviously nobody's trying to get their name out if they're doing it anonymously. That was kind of cool. And it's usually like uh, one guy I think was helping an old lady or something at a store. She, she, he was helping her carry out bags or something. And this guy came up and said, here you go. Merry Christmas. And he was like, what? And the guy's gone and he opens it and was like, oh my God, is this real? So that's the kind of giving that uh, you know, your name's not attached. It's not like you're getting any kickbacks from that, if that makes sense. So at least that story, that's what I imagine that person's like, who knows? All right. We're at 46 minutes. So I'll take any last second questions and then I'll wrap up. So again, Wolfgang Klein, he will be on the show again. Um, hopefully I won't have any gremlins in the internet connection. Um, uh, so frustrating to me personally, because, uh, you know, you want to be a good host. Um, I want to give him a way to get out the information on a great game that he's made. Um, it's really, really neat. And it has, it's, it's got this depth to it that it looks like he's going to be able to attach on. I mean, he's got the Stukas and, and, uh, artillery and he's working on fortifications and forests and there's a uh, tiger tank and all this cool stuff that this looks like it could go and go and go. Um, uh, the, uh, the shipping makes me nervous. That's why I talked to him a little bit about, you know, the shipping and printing and what all is going on. And, um, and, but he's got it going on. He's got it going on. Thank you for everybody that's tuned in. I'm going to go ahead and shut her down now just for folks that come in and watch later. Uh, look for, um, what will probably be two or three more episodes of Twilight 2000, although I will play it out as long as it goes. I'm not looking to rush it. Um, it's been quite the compelling story for me personally. I know it's long, but it, it just rolls as it rolls. And then we'll be doing something, something else. Role playing will continue on this channel. And GMT is supposed to be sending me Charioteer. Am I pronouncing it right? Uh, that's that chariot racing game that's coming out, um, I think, within the next two or three weeks. So I'll be doing an unboxing of that and then a review of that after I get some playtime of that in. Uh, looks like it should be a fun racing game. All right, everybody. See you later. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for watching. <laughs>